Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. This is it, people. We did it. Somehow, together, we have reached the two-year anniversary of Vox and Hops. I can't believe that we've made it this far. I'm super stoked and humbled and honored that all of you have listened to the podcast, helped me grow the podcast by sharing it with your friends, sharing it with like-minded individuals. I love that very, very much, and I appreciate it. Thank you all so, so much. I also want to raise my glass and a huge cheers to all of the guests that I have ever had on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time giving me a chance to uh, have a conversation with me. I I really, really appreciate it. And we would have never made it to the two year anniversary mark of Vox and Hops without all of you people. I love you all to death. Uh, Massive, massive shout out to my wife and producer Jessica Buckingham for all of her help, all of her patience in regards to Vox and Hops. Uh, She is a very, very crucial part to it. So uh, everyone give her a cheers as well. This is it, people. This is a very, very special episode. Now, I wish that I had recorded this live in front of an audience, as I did last year's for the one-year anniversary, but sadly, it was just impossible. So I did the best thing that I could, and I hosted this roundtable discussion via Zoom, which is the platform that I have been using for most of my episodes during the pandemic, and I'm super stoked about how it turned out. So here it is, everyone. Get ready. This is the second anniversary for Vox and Hops episode, the Cryptopsy Vocalist Roundtable Discussion featuring Lord Worm, Mike DeSalvo, Martin Lacroix, myself, and it is moderated by Bradley Zorgdrager of Banger TV and exclaim, this is Vox and Hops episode number 197. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everybody? Today is a very special episode because it is the second anniversary for Vox and Hops, and I have planned a monumentous Vox and Hops episode, which uh, I'm super stoked to have each and every one of you here with me tonight uh, to make this a reality. This is something that I've been wanting to do for a very long time before I even interviewed any of you, really. It's something that I've wanted to do when I started the podcast to do a full cryptopsy vocalist roundtable discussion and uh, it's I had to interview each of you first so first I interviewed Martin Lacroix back when I was on tour in Germany back on episode 18 of Vox and Hops then I had the chance to hang out uh, with Bradley uh, on episode 39 and then I did Lord Worm last year for my one year anniversary which was episode 82 of Vox and Hops and then last winter I hung out with Mike DeSalvo episode 103 and now here we are a bunch of Vox and Hops alumni all together to hang out and to uh, pick the brain, our brains about being cryptopsy vocalists, and we're just going to hang out and have a good time. But I wanted to have a good time and hang out as well, so I invited a guest host for the very first time. Uh, this is Bradley Zorgdrager of Banger TV fame. He also writes for Exclaim. Um, thank you so much, Bradley, for being here and helping me moderate this roundtable discussion. I'm super stoked about it. Uh, how are you doing, Bradley? And thank you so much. Oh yeah, man. I'm 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 excited. I was really excited when when you asked as a, as a longtime fan of of the band, and um, you know, obviously you and I are are, are familiar uh, with one another. We're friends, and um, uh, I've, I've spoken with Mike on on Facebook a little bit here and there. Um, but uh, this is the first time I'm getting acquainted with Worm uh, and with Martin. This is my first time, so I'm excited, man. It's it's gonna be good. Awesome, awesome. So. Let's crack open some beers. Some of you have already started. Uh, let's introduce our beers because it is Vox and Hops. Bradley, you don't drink, so what are you not drinking tonight? Uh, I've got I've got Rain Energy, which is just like a an energy drink, but it's like I don't know, it's like lots of caffeine, low on calories. I guess that's it's like its thing. Uh, I got the sour apple one. I, I had a flavor that was called like Melon Mania, but I know sometimes you ask to like describe the flavor, and I didn't know what kind of melon it was. So I decided to go with sour apple because I know what that flavor is. And if I had to describe what melon the melon was, I'd be like, I don't know, like maybe watermelon, maybe 
cantaloupe. I don't know, dude. So that's what I got. Very cool. Uh, for myself, I have chosen three beers, which match the three vocalists that I'm here with, the other three vocalists of Cryptopsy. I'm starting off with uh, something in honor of Lord Worm, something that I think that he would enjoy. I have chosen uh, Silo, uh, which is a new brewery here in Montreal, Brasserie Silo, and it's their Louvain, which is a, a Sveti Lezak. It is a German style pilsner, and uh, I'm super stoked to crack it open and uh, pour it out. And what are you drinking, Worm? I'm drinking Blanc Craig and Reed, and it's a Svetli Lezak as well. <laughs> you guys like talk beforehand or something? What's up? They, they've coordinated. No, see, I knew it. I knew that it was the perfect choice for you, uh, Worm. Uh, what do you got on your side there, Mike? Well, I have in this delicious glass. I have Petit Caribou or Pit Caribou, La Gaspésie, Gaspésian, classic uh, porter, Fuck yeah. 6.2, delicious. I mean, everyone's had this. I hope if you haven't, then, you know, you must. I, ha- I haven't. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I've already owned it. <laughs> et toi, Martin, you, Martin, what are you drinking? Actually, I think I would start with uh, that Gorgots beer, this one here, and uh, I need to see. I need to say I don't want to throw flowers on me, but uh, this is my drawing. Really? See, I didn't know that. So, I, finally, I, I got one of my drawing on a beer. So, the next step will be on a whiskey or a scotch. That will be amazing. Very cool. But uh, I opened this. Uh, it's, um, they call it Obscure IPA because um, the company is uh, Moulin, yep. Moulin Set. Moulin from uh, Asbestos, and they wanted to uh, to do a, a, a beer to uh, for uh, Gorgos the uh, 20th uh, anniversary of uh, Obscura album. So uh, they want to make a, a dark beer stout, but Luke really really likes IPA, so they made a stout IPA ish. Uh, so it's uh, eight percent and. Pretty, really dark. <laughs> That's sick. That's perfect. Um, Bradley, go for it. Where are we going? Take us on our first topic. So, I mean, I guess I guess to start, and I guess um, this is kind of Worm's call, uh, what are we defining as as the start of Cryptopsy? Are we doing, you know, 88 with, with obsessive compulsive disorder or like the necrosis period or the, the brief Gamora stint? Or are we just, wh- where, where, where does Cryptopsy start for you? What do you define as Cryptopsy? Well, that's your call. That's your call. It's your band. The start, I guess, would have to be uh, late necrosis. Uh, I used to bitch more in the uh, classic thrash style, and it was suggested to me by uh, Sylvain Hood, uh, ex of Cataclysm, if I would you know dig deeper into my bowels and get some really gurgly shit going. And I did that for the uh, third necrosis demo. So that's pretty much. The start, and then, of course, when uh, Necrosis played in uh, New Bedford with, among other people, Infestation with Mike, there was at least one other band there also named Necrosis, so a name change. So for two weeks, we were Gomorra until Flo was flipping through a fanzine and found another Gomorra. So, all right, here we go again. (laughs) So we each brought about, like, I don't know, 30 names to the table on paper and just voted the yeses and noes and stupids and we decided on cryptopsy hell yeah very cool so the way i i kind of want to start start this out is i don't want this to be a rehash of all of your individual podcasts where we just kind of do the history and whatnot i think that 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 would be boring if you if you want to know the specific history of all that stuff go listen to each of the individual episodes which which matt already mentioned earlier um but in in order to like you know kind of break the ice and get things kind of moving and and, and kind of get some of the history in there I, I i propose uh you know there's four vocalists let's go no no rules like no no you get one minute you get one minute but let's go four vocalists Four minute history of cryptopsy. Anybody can talk. Uh, you know, anybody anybody want to start that? Just go through the history of the band, and if somebody forgets something, cut them off and throw that out, and we'll we'll see where we get to, and then we'll get to more specific questions. But you know, I think it's almost like an interesting social experiment, or not social experiment, but to see what rises to the top. You know, what 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 you in, initially think about. Well, we were always rather spinal tapish. 
<laughs> in our stupidity and our clumsiness and our change of personnel. That's one thing. Uh, we've changed bases how many times over the years from the Croesus onwards? <laughs> Jesus. And of course, we have four of us. How many guitarists? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> four, four or five, five, five at least. Yeah. I think you, we could met. We could we could make like a three bands <laughs> of cryptopsy with all the next members. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is it is it like true that there is actually right now no uh, founding members in the band at this point? Right. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> that, uh, that's where it goes sometimes. <laughs> at least Flo has been there that long. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's, been, yeah. he's been in the band the whole time since they called themselves Cryptopsy. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But he was in Necrosis, actually. That is correct. We uh, oh, that's true. before him, there yeah, was Mike yeah. Atkin, yeah. who could go fast but didn't like going fast because he was such a burly gentleman that it, when he went fast, he would actually steam and it hurt him. <laughs> and so one night, uh, Steve Debo and I went to see Morbid Angel and thought, yeah, that's a good idea to speed like that. So we called up Mike, said, you're fired, and then got a hold of Flo a little bit later and said, yeah, you want to try out? Okay. That was it. <laughs> then you guys released Ungentle. I didn't call it that. They, they surprised me with that. And I would have I would have preferred a different title. Really? Why just, you know, why just fish something out of my lyrics? Why not just call it something else? Do you, do you know what you'd call it if, 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 if you were put on the spot right now, or you'd have to think about that more? I'd have to think about it. I didn't have a name for it at the time. I was just hoping maybe in a, an eponymous release. Which would actually come later, many years later. That's correct. Many, many years later. <laughs> when yeah. I was put to the point of not knowing what to call an album. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, you put out that. You put out the demo. You put out a couple full lengths, blah, blah, blah. You know, Worm Left. Mike Sam, blah blah blah. The history. Go watch the other episodes. We we got we got good enough for there. So um, <laughs> so I guess you know the the one thing that I really wanted to focus on in this because it is you know what what really makes this episode special is that you're all here. So I'm I'm more interested in 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 the interaction amongst all of all of you and and you know you all have distinct uh, personalities uh, like you know as as people but also vocally which is you know what why people are here they're here for the vox and the hops uh so i was wondering if each of you could you know kind of describe your your favorite thing about one of the about the other vocalists like oh i really like how uh mike you know does does this with his vowels or, or whatever like what vocally what kind of stands out for each of you about your your i guess comrades in cryptopsy perfect i can take this one very easily when I first started rehearsing and trying to learn the material when I finally got the gig back in 2007, uh, immediately I was more drawn towards Mike's style because I could understand it better. <laughs> I was more able to digest uh, the patterns, and that was something that, that I was drawn towards. Uh, Wormies, it took me like a long time to, to understand. I remember calling them and be like, does he say all these words <laughs> for real? Is that true? <laughs> it can't be true. I don't, tell me it's not true, but it was true. And we talked about that one night when I interviewed Worm and, uh, over the years that just the appreciation of, of the, the lyrical aspect of Lord Worm is something that I appreciate and adore and revere a hundred percent. I don't know about you guys. Uh, can I, I would go. Uh, I actually, um, I, uh, the first time I heard Cryptopsy, maybe I was 16, something like that. Uh, I already listened a little bit to Suffocation, Cat Cast, something like that. But for me, I really like that, um, that kind of a creepy, disgusting aesthetic. Like, <laughs> kind of. I really, really liked it. And uh, for me, it was like the, the, the most, um spooky or death metal that I, i've heard and um yeah i, I was really digging in uh, to uh warm uh warm's vocal that i really like that <laughs> um and then where with mike uh, when whisper came out i was whoa it was like fucking brutal and really like um how can i say like um i on adrenaline kind of you know really you know, it's it's urgent. <laughs> there's a there's an emergency. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that that's well. Uh, and actually, with Mike, what I really liked 
It was a hard work for me to figure out all the fucking tempo you did, fucker. <laughs> <laughs> Scheiße. So just the tempos in general? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. But both of you guys, I, I got uh, inspired by a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'll say from uh, from you know from the from the Lord Worm uh, the Wormy uh, uh, aspect of it, um, uh, right away it was it was the unhinged vocals, uh, the I mean, just the, the the craziness, the the live show, the the presence on stage, the uh, you know the absolute control of the crowd, and um, this was this was all super impressive to me when I first saw them. I, I mean, and subsequent shows after, of course, um, and then lyrically, I mean, I think it's. By by not some of the best lyrics in in uh, metal. I hold you were when the, you heard Cryptopsy. when I heard Cryptopsy. Pff, oh man! Um, well, you already knew it was Necroxis anyway. Yeah, I knew back it was in 1992. So yeah, maybe 20, 22, somewhere in that range. I don't know. Uh, some, early on, that's for sure. Like a lot, a lot of years prior to now. Um, yeah, I would say you know that was that was sort of the, the, the things that gravitated me uh, towards uh, towards Wormy's style. Uh, Martin, uh, you know, for me, when when I heard "None So Live" and I and I went into it listening, I said, okay, I, you know, just I want to hear how this new thing is pulling this off, you know. And uh, and and I honestly, I have to say, I was I was incredibly impressed by uh, by that show, like how you how you were versatile in the sense that you were singing both. Um, both styles of vocals, you know, you, you pulled it together on his styles, you were singing his, his styles, and then on my on, on songs that I was on, you were pulling it together for, uh, for exactly like you said, for the tempos and the time changes and things. So uh, that, was, that was impressive to me, and I, uh, I, I held true to the first time I listened to it. I was like, okay, like this, this, there's some serious vocal prowess here, and, and someone who's come in and done a damn, damn, damn good job. Thank you, man. Uh, I think, I think, and thank you. But I, I can say, uh, yeah, the way I was, the way I was singing was like, uh, because they were not my songs, you know. So I, I put maybe like uh, maybe 50, 60 percent of myself, but then the warm songs I was doing it that way, and your song I was doing it more in the mic style as well. You agreed, and I heard I heard it from from the start. So yeah, yeah. But uh, I, what I feel ashamed a little bit. It's sometimes you you know guys, sometimes the vocal is not there. You know, it's just like, damn, I'm the fuck. And and that day when I woke up in the mor uh, morning, late afternoon, <laughs> uh, I was, man, there's something, man, uh, what the fuck? So I was drinking tea with honey, hot water, all the way to try to, uh, uh, it just didn't go. So um, instead, sometimes you, you can push like 80, 90% of yourself and then it sounds like, and but that night I need to push like 110, 120 to reach that 90 percent <laughs> kind of. So uh, it was exhausting for me that concert. Man, to, uh, always like try to it, it will pop up some somehow. <laughs> you know the the, the, the you know. <laughs> but uh, the show, yeah, the but show I, must I, go I, on. I, I might be anyway. I mean, I'm anyways. It's that night. It's one time. It's live. Awesome. It's, that's it. And I'll just finish up with uh, with Matt as well. The first time uh, listening to Matt on uh, on vocals, of course, was um, was uh, the Unspoken King. And um, I, I, you know, for me, the, the first things that struck me was uh, the ferociousness of the voice. First of all, like he, he, your voice is fucking Omax, super heavy, and, uh, and right away, uh, that, was, that was something that gravitated. But then secondary pieces that I, I, I drew along the way was the lyrics, like the storytelling. Uh, I, I love the way you, it's, it's, it's unorthodox. It's very storytelling, and it's not, you know, you're not, it's, it's not like rock, one, two, three, four. It's, it, you, you're writing, and it's, it's not necessarily coming back to you know the chorus and stuff like that so I, I i personally appreciate that style of writing and uh and the content of what you were writing and i also like the fact that you were you were doing things that were out of the box in terms of cryptopsy you know the fact that you tried to add some you know and and like you and i have spoken about that you know and uh, i think with with hearing the, the the cleaner vocals i think personally i think they work on that album there's a couple of parts that i remember thinking back like uh, i don't know i don't i'm not, not sure but but as a whole, man, I think I think that album has got a lot of balls. I think that album, the, the riffs are, are strong, and and then all the subsequent albums, of course. I mean, uh, now, you know, now you're, you're you're singing just you know it's 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 heavier, but you've got multiple different voices, 
and uh, it's fucking precise and tight. And, you know, I, 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 I mean, we're talking about really, you know, having this chance to talk about three incredible vocalists. Like, it's, it's, uh, I, I can sit here and talk about the three of you all night long. You know, <laughs> everyone fucking, we'll be drinking some beers and, uh, yeah, you know, let's not talk about, we'll talk about your vocals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say, but uh, everything that I do, do when I am tracking something for Cryptopsy or writing for Cryptopsy is an homage to the past while putting a little color of myself into it. So so it's I really try to give an homage to the, the Lord Worm era, the Mike DeSalvo era, and uh, it's something that's very important for me and to, that I think that the fans need. Have you read Mike's lyrics on the uh, just released Acurion album? I have, yes. Whoa. <laughs> Such a fan. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say something about uh, about Matt. It's like uh, um, you you have an incre incredible technique that I could never reach. I can I cannot. I tried and uh, how the fuck you do that? <laughs> a lot of breath in there. No, thank you. That, it's not for nothing that his first band was called uh, Three Miles. Three Miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just keep on going, man. <laughs> we played this with us in Toronto. We did, absolutely, yes. And uh, Cambridge, Matt, we were talking about that earlier. That's true. We played together twice or three times, but it was specifically that Toronto gig where I was looking at you guys and I was like, oh, holy shit, I'd love to be in Cryptopsy one day. But it was totally at that gig. I remember the moment. Do you remember the song? No, no, because I wasn't that Uber fan. Right, right. I was, I was, I enjoyed the band, but I wasn't. It's, it wasn't that Mark Wahlberg rock star moment when I get the mic handed to me. <laughs> totally, totally. That that would have been a disaster. <laughs> Be like, I don't know this part. Actually, I thought it was cool. I don't know any of these parts. <laughs> Hell yeah. And 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 Worm, I guess, like, what was it like for for you? I I mean, I I, I understand that um, Mike was kind of he he kind of got your nod of approval, your sign off. But what was it? What was it like to hear him singing? your songs and then uh hearing him carry the torch and then i guess i guess hearing uh martin do it uh on on none so live and and then matt take over uh from there well after you know you came back and then take over from there i hardly remember any of it strange to say no it's true i hardly remember any of it you ever notice live you don't remember doing anything you know you were there but any specific moment, any specific song. I know what songs I played because, you know, it's the same ones every night all the time and the ones that you know, people want to hear, but I don't remember doing it. I remember having, you know, my first coffee of the day in other cities with the actual shows and the fans and my impressions of things, I have no clue. Sorry. It's all good. So, I mean, I guess the, the one, you know, thing that I've got here, which I agree with from, you know, listening to the band and all of that is that, you know, there are, you know, two essentially distinct styles, which are like the worm style and, and the DeSalvo style. And then, and then um, Matt and, and, and Martin, when you guys came in, you kind of wanted to meld the two and do justice to both of them. So I guess, um, Mike, was that your goal coming in? Like how much of it was, I want to set myself apart as 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 an entity and how much of it did you feel did you feel at all constrained uh to try to fit within the box of what people thought cryptopsy were or uh, i'm just curious how you came up with your style i mean i know you you know were involved in like the hardcore scene and stuff as well so that might have played some part so i'm just curious you know about that how you came to develop the mike DeSalvo sound yeah you know i mean i i i really went into it with with uh, intentions of being just myself and uh, not trying to adopt the same sound as, as Worm. Um, I didn't want, at, at the time, I felt it, wouldn't, it would have been an injustice, honestly, uh, at that time to just come in and just all of a sudden be not who I was to follow in the footsteps of, of uh, uh, somebody who, you know, quite frankly, is tough, tough, you know, shoes to fill. Um, the last thing I wanted uh, was to, to have that extra pressure of, trying to sound like somebody else or trying to be someone else. Uh, it's not me anyways, you know, it's not, it was never really something that I, I, I can safely say that it was never anything that I actually said to myself, uh, I'm not going to, or I maybe, you know, should I do this? Or, it was just sort of a natural progression into it. And I did what I knew how to do. And, 
And, you know, I went in, I learned the songs, and I, I threw, it, threw the songs out the way I would have thrown them out with any band that I would have gone to sing for. You know, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was with absolute intent to do me, you know, and not, uh, not uh, try and create, a, a, like, a farce or, you know, something that just wasn't going to be natural, you know. Uh, he, there's, only one, there's only one worm, you know. So to, uh, it, just, it just didn't feel right to, to, to do that. But that being said, there was, there, I have done like nods to him. We were talking about, I was just talking about this with someone else with uh, uh, Cold Hate and Warm Blood. That song was already written when I had come in. That and White Worms were already written. So when I had come in to learn, basically I learned the whole, uh, all the songs from all the discs and then started working on those two songs. Those two songs were ones that I really wanted to work on. So I was trying to get through the rest of the songs quick or quicker so I could actually do those songs, right? And then do my own shit. So, uh, but I remember there's, there's that section in uh, Cold Hate Warm Blood where it's the, the your, um, the months. about the months, yeah. yeah. So it's, so he rattles them off, like it's just, so hard. and there's, there's just no way. And, for, and my style is no fucking way I'm gonna pull that off. So I was just talking about this with someone uh, and I just said, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I really, I, I, I took a couple of catchphrases from it and just gobbled over the rest of it and tried to do something that would, was a nod to you, you know? in that section. So I mean, it's not to say that I didn't, you know, I wasn't ever trying to, trying to bring, uh, bring about the, um, you know, the essence of, of Worm. Um, I did in that song. I, I felt it was right. It was, it was a good opportunity to do it because there was just no way I was going to be able to rattle off like a sentence that's this big and a section that is this big. <laughs> you know, you both of you know. I remember when I first saw it and I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way and i'm like going through and like stop rewind this is back on the day you know you didn't have like a digital thing where you could just move the thing oh, or repeat yeah. anything it was like i had to go physically go do this and <laughs> crossing out <laughs> words <laughs> absolutely it's hard it is a, a little uh, anecdote uh i was on tour um i don't remember which tour but anyway and then uh, like um with uh your your songs mike uh, the the words are really important because it's more pronounced. It's, you know, it's so everything. It's it's more there. But uh, the worm, uh, I liked in way. If you don't hear the lyrics that much, but I liked to know the the lyrics to have a, a path. You know, to 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 how uh, to pronounce. Even if you go like a like fifty percent on the word, <laughs> kind of. But uh, it was on uh, football file, and I fucking didn't remember the lyrics. And I, I, I had not, I, I had no CD with me or something like that to 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 remind me the the lyrics. And then ah, oh, so there's that that live uh, that live concert somebody <laughs> uh, recorded, and I was listening to it, and even. Me sing sing this? I could not catch the words. Can't just you can't just look it up on Spotify like you can these days, right? You know. But, uh, yeah. So somebody somebody found <laughs> found a CD somewhere. And then like, oh, okay, yeah, true, it's that. Okay, okay, cool, I'm fine. In two thousand one, two thousand two, there were no even cell phones at that time. Right. That actually that makes a good segue because I actually you know had you know we've got we've got multiple lyricists here, um, and you know I appreciate you know in in talking about what's you know what you all think of each other as vocalists you all actually touched on on the lyrics and you know you have a an appreciation for each other as 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 lyricists and i guess you know i'd kind of want to start this uh with matin because um you, you didn't get the chance to actually write any lyrics for the band so you kind of have the i guess the wider uh lens like what do you think defines you know cryptopsy's lyrical output because there's you know three very different you know Lyricist, but is there a, is there a connecting thread that kind of makes it feel cryptopsy esque? Uh, but at, at that time, there was only two, Warren and Mike. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, on my side, um, to 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 write big lyrics, it's really hard work for me, uh, um, even in French. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I had some really good idea, but it goes for one paragraph, two maybe a few lines later but then you need to develop and then th this is where i had a hard time um so I, I need to 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 really work a lot a lot to wrote lyrics that fits and all that 
uh, it was my my big uh, but as a singer maybe it's a lack but in uh, in many bands like you know, Rush or whatever it's uh, the drummers the drummers are writing lyrics and uh, in my first band as well uh, Spaz um, uh, it was a drummer who wrote a lot of lyrics sometimes I was coming with ideas and then we develop it together you know but uh, he had uh, that drummer just uh, he had a lot of uh, credits for lyrics on my first band I had before uh, but I really 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 liked uh, both style of lyrics from Worm and Mike as well uh, it's really uh, poet poetry kind of uh, yeah it's, it's it's something that you can imagine you can dig into it and see pictures that I really like that like a love craption kind of for myself definitely I see like a, the overlying theme of cryptopsy lyrics being definitely dark you know it comes with the genre that they're all going to be dark uh, but we all took it in different directions whereas I went more true historical stories of atrocities is, is the way that I conveyed the darkness. Uh, Worm what took it in more of a comedic form, which which is something that I didn't quite understand at first, but the more that I got into it, the more that I listened to it, the more that I sang it, I understood that it was coming from a almost like a, a, a dark humor, which is something that I really appreciate. And uh, Mike's was just more, you know, darkness, but, but uh, in a very poetic form. As as Martin said, yeah, I, I definitely hear like the, the the poetic, you know, nature of it. Like to me, as as an outsider, that's something that has stayed true through all lyricists of the band. That no matter what you're saying, you're always saying it in like a in like a unique way. You're not you're not just you know getting out there and doing the I don't know like the the metalcore bands do the thing, and it's just like. You know, like before the breakdown, they do like the one line where it's just like, it's not poetry at all. It's just meant for a reaction almost. And you guys, you know, have always, it's always been based in something that's a little bit more, uh, you know, like you said, dark, but also like kind of very beautiful. Um, even in, even when it, you know, even when it comes, you know, to, to Worm being like, you know, uh, like dark humor, like you were saying, like it, it, it feels very, uh, fluid and like, um, yeah, beautiful for lack of a, a of a better word. I, I mean, Worm, what were your what were your goals? Um, you know, with with these the the lyrics, like it's just like uh, you know, it's just it's very unique. So I'm curious where where you're coming from. I can't not write. I'm still writing to this day, not in hopes of any future projects. I just I can't stop writing. The ideas just come, mostly in the afternoons. Don't know why. And happily, I always have uh, paper and pen next to me. I'm old school. Well, I'm old. I turned 55 this year. I could move to retirement community. Just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah, that's still right. Actually, I uh, spent part of last weekend uh, with uh, the Dutch uh, Nuclei. Awesome. Uh, who are thinking maybe more material, not under the Dutch Nuclei name, but uh, something new, something even more angry. So I might just be doing some lyrics and vocals for them. Or we got, I got a few already pre-written, just in case. That that is a big difference between me and Mike, and Worm, because Mike is a writer too. He he writes actively. I never ever write anything until I have the material in front of me. So that that's something that is very different between my style of preparing for an album and uh, these two guys. Yeah, I, I always try to have something. Uh, that that that's a fact for sure. I always have. Uh, whenever a project comes up, I honestly I'm lucky enough to have like a wealth of shit to draw from. Yeah, uh, look, yeah, yeah. just That's so cool. Take if I if I find something that that meshes with the riffs or the, the you know or the the pattern that I'm thinking, um, you know, then uh, or or I, I you know I mean there's, there's countless times where I start something and I've got some pre written lyrics and then I realize you know this I don't know it's not working out dump it and the song becomes another fucking song it's either on the spot or another piece that's been hanging around so the the you know, Curion album i mean you be, you were working on that for a very long time like what's the oldest line that you've got on that album like how how far back we go in there that was i think it was it was like eight years in the making but there was some lyrics that that i had uh before that actually the lyrics that i had that were the, the, the oldest ones uh, i had written just a poem of uh, souvenir gardens and um really had written it as a poem and uh then i just I don't know. I think I think when when we came around to that song, 
Uh, I fooled around with the idea of it, but then there wasn't enough lyrics, so then I added to it. So I have the actual poem, and then I, you know, added some more lyrics to it that, to create the actual song itself. That that was the oldest one that I had in my possession at the time, and I would say that one was, you know, if, this, if this was eight years ago, that was probably in the vicinity of like t like two years prior to that. That I had them already written, and then drew from that, and then drew new inspiration from from what I had already written to add them into the pods for you know that were lacking you know uh, lacking lyrics or lacking enough lyrics to, to was it was it hard for you to reinsert yourself back into that into that place like I don't know how you know if I I've written you know not that I play in bands but I've written some po poems and stuff as well and I've gone back to write stuff and it's been very hard to get myself back in that that mind frame where I feel that my words do I guess justice to what I was initially saying did you have any difficulty kind of getting back there or that one in particular, it does happen. I, I've had that with other songs for sure. I have one just recently that I that I was pulling together and I was having a hard time drawing new lyrics for it. Um, that one, some of the extra lyrics were just pretty seamless. And then uh, there were other parts that I remember like hemming and hawing over for a while, um, you know, changing, re removing some, you know, like a uh, couple words to place it a little bit better or, you know, uh, stuff like that. But I mean, in, in I would say it was sort of, that, that song was like a half and half. Some of it came together you know, quite well, quite easily. And then others were, uh, I had a fool around in Tampa with, uh, but you know, the song that I recently, that I, I literally, I was just adding some, some parts to it. And as I was adding these parts to it, I was like, fuck, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even the same, like, it's not even talking about the same thing. I'm like writing all these lyrics and I'm like, this is like a totally different song. So I actually took those and, and I'll use it for something else. And then, you know, work, work in something that's a little bit more relatable to, to the actual first, uh, thoughts that had come out and poured out on paper crazy uh i'm moving into uh the beer that is inspired by mechtai because it is a, a very experimental uh i find it's very artistic and i think that you are very artistic obviously being a great <laughs> tattoo artist and visual artist in general this is a uh, pub brewski's it's it's, it's a they're experimental brews so Pinacolata. exactly Pina Ooh, from this is, uh, the beer that I'm drinking in your honor because it's, it's so artistic. Is it beer? Is the real question. <laughs> oh, oh, <wow. laughs> it's a. <laughs> I was. I had in mind. I was thinking about two martinis, so I bought a pina colada. <laughs> well, because it's so experimental and artistic. It's a smoothie sour. <laughs> Maybe we go to Cuba together, man. <laughs> <laughs> By Pub Brewski, it has pineapple, coconut, and and marshmallow in it. Marshmallow? Yeah. Pineapple and marshmallow. Pineapple, coconut, and marshmallow. Five percent. Is it beer? I don't think so, but it's delicious. <laughs> uh, shout out to uh, Guillaume from Brewski for hooking me up with this. But when we had that um, that interview together in Essen, uh, in Germany, we had the pineapple. Beer. IPA, yes, from McKellar, I think, if I remember correctly. But I remember, uh, should I, uh, I'm not with her anymore, doesn't matter, but I, I had that, that girlfriend, and when we did that, oh, it tastes amazing, she's going to taste it later. <laughs> yep, I heard, I heard that today, I listened to that today. <laughs> she did it, and then, when I say that, I was like, oh, shit, uh, I should not say that, but yeah, I would check it out later, but uh, she, it's okay. she really... Uh, she wasn't enjoyed about that. I was going to say, was that the part that you were talking over when it came up and you just kept talking over it so she wouldn't catch it? <laughs> oh, damn. Even this like is, six uh... months later, she was still... Did you say that live? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This was a joke. Man, yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, as you guys were talking before, I had the idea of... Uh, um, I personally wasn't extremely good in english class in school you guys being such prolific writers did, did you did you succeed well was english an easy subject for you guys worm and and mike and uh martin en français no trouble no trouble at all uh, things i grew up with uh, both you know canadian official languages uh, my dad was from newfoundland and only spoke english mom was from ottawa and she was a courte manche in her uh, in her youth and she was brought up with French, though she's you know, bilingual. So I heard both languages in my house when dad was flying. He was a pilot for Air Canada. 
Uh, I would hear only French from mom, but when he was home, all of a sudden I was hearing English from dad. So I grew up with both. So, you know, school and languages was easy for me. I'm hardwired for languages anyway. Yeah, for me too. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I, I always liked to write. I used to write like stupid bullshit stories uh, when I was a kid, like uh, literally third or fourth grade, I was writing stories. I'd incorporate my, one of my close friends actually. It was like these mystery fucking, you know, super lame stories. Uh, but I'd have like pages and pages and show them to the teacher. The teacher would love, oh, it's really cool. It's really cool. It sucked, but oh, it's really cool. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I'd say my first like set of lyrics, like, I must have been like maybe 14 or something. I was had this idea that, oh, I can write. Uh, sure, I can write. I can write. And I literally remember, and I'll share this with you only because it's box and hops. I, I will share with you those lyrics. No way. And, and, literally, and it's only the chorus section of it. And I had written it, and I was like, whoa, this is fucking tight, man. It was... The Russians attack! The Russians attack! The Russians attack! They're gonna kick your ass! <laughs> I was like, oh, it was like the song was called Nuclear Devastation or something. And I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna fucking rock. This is gonna rock. And then I remember, like, looking back at it, like, I don't know, a couple years later when I could, you know, I was starting to figure out writing and shit. I looked back at that and I fucking crumpled it up. There is no trace of that except on this fucking show right now. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mike. And that's why we do this. That's why we're doing this right now, to get yeah. little nuggets like that. <laughs> I want to feel closer to you now. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I write, you know, professionally as my job. I write about music and, and this and that. And I actually was not very good at English in school. I mean, I was relatively good uh, compared to a lot of other people because I was quite, uh, like... I'm academically like school has always come quite naturally to me. Um, but that English was one of my worst subjects. I, I, I think I must've missed a few key grammar lessons when I was a kid and I didn't know how to use commas properly or whatever. Uh, and then I had um, a teacher in grade, I want, it was either grade 11 or grade 12. And I had a teacher for an, a writer's craft class and they kind of went over some of the grammatical concepts again. And I was like, oh, like I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So I got that more. And I don't know why she didn't, you know, send me to the counselor and get me kicked out of school. Cause she let me, you could write about anything. So I just wrote about killing people the whole time because I listened to, <laughs> I listened to death metal. I remember there was a presentation we had to do about a very specific yeah, uh, literary style. And I chose um, uh, splatter punk, which is just like the most obs like, uh, like intense gore that you can. I literally played exhumed in class because i like the lyrics <laughs> i like the lyrics uh hacked to pieces they found her or rather they scraped her off the floor because i thought that was so like visceral like i could almost smell like the like the chemicals as they're cleaning it up and you could really see it um and, and, and so I, I that i mean man writing about killing people led to me <laughs> professionally r writing about killing people about bands who write about that. So uh, <laughs> it's funny, you know, English was not my main subject until my teacher let me write about whatever I wanted to, which ended up being very gory. Uh, so that's my, that, that's a question that, you know, Matt, you just put out there that I was able to answer actually, you know, vocal stuff can't, can't do, but that one, I can answer that one. So yeah, lyrically, uh, they, you know, there's always been, you know, that's always something that's, that I've gravitated towards to, to see what, you know, what bands are writing and stuff like that. It's, it's always been, you know, since the earlier, early on, even with rock and stuff like that. But uh, even for high school, you say high school. And the one thing that, you know, I was always gravitating towards that kind of writing, you know, sick, twisted shit. And then uh, one of the lines that always, always got me was Hallow's Eve. I remember Hallow's Eve, Death and Insanity. And uh, there's the, the, yeah, there's, there's the one line um where it's uh, what is it bloody bodies in the debris and i had that on my yearbook picture i wrote it down inside there i was like this fucking there is no way this will get in there and sure enough they wiped it out. oh dude. <laughs> i was like but i'm gonna put it in there and let's see if it flies maybe they'll let you know they'll miss it but uh and i think that was on that's the one that's on the the river's edge the song that's on the river, river's edge i forget the name of the tune but uh but the, the, the whole song's full of like sick lines like that I was like, yeah, this would be perfect for my yearbook. What could go wrong? My my yearbook quote, I they, they put, where will you be in five years? I put dead in a ditch. They didn't let that go. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and then my 
I told my friend, and he said, you should have put dead in two ditches. That'd be more metal. I'm like, shit, I played that one. Since we're talking about lyrics, you know, like brutal lyrics or whatever that that stuck out, like, do do, I, do any of the rest of you guys have, like, a lyric that, you know, just really, I don't know why that exhumed, I, I just like how visceral that lyric is. So, like, Worm, is there a, a specific lyric that, that you really like or, you know, or Martin or, or Matt, you know, since me and uh, Mike have already dropped ours? Me, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't have favorites. I don't play favorites. I just I like stuff and I don't favoritize anything. I love all my children equally. Blah blah. <laughs> for for myself, I'm I'm horrible at remembering lyrics. As much as I, I appreciate it as a child, I feel like when I was young, I was able to pick up lyrics a lot easier than than uh, now in my as I get older. So so now when I when I listen to music I I don't actually hear the lyrics I hear the lyrics but it's more of the delivery and the 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 vocal abilities that that draw me into a band personally like the rest of you pigs no oh, nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but I, I was singing that like uh, yesterday at my I'm at my place uh, wa- washing my shelf and we we bleed <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, uh, for myself, I think, uh, uh, but it's like all, all those old school metal, you just put like G-side, Morbid Angel, whatever, I, I can sing all the fucking album. It just came out just like that. I fucking remember everything. But nowadays, a bit less, maybe because at that time they were less banned as well. And it's, yeah, the new Born with Angel coming out. So you just listen to it like back to back and, you know, fuck it, it's, it's always there. But uh, maybe nowadays uh, I have more abilities to remember jokes than <laughs> lyrics. <laughs> I don't know if it ties into the format changing. We used to have the physical CD, the physical LP, and you can actually, it was a living, breathing thing that you could actually flip through and the lyrics were there. But there's something else. Uh, so th- there's so many bands now. So and uh, I think all of us, all of us guys, we are we are getting like really picky. Okay, if there's a little spice or a little texture that we don't like, flip. Next, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it's, yeah. So it's, it's like that. And um, so then you you got to flip. A fucking scroll a lot of bands to find one. Oh, okay, this one is good, and so I might buy the album. You know, instead of back back in the days, New Morbid New Morbid Angel came out. You buy it. That's it. You, you don't you don't fucking ask yourself. You know, and uh, yeah. So that's the, that's a big difference nowadays. And a good friend of mine told me too that um, Hugues de Laurier. That is a sound engineer as well, and uh, and um, like in the seventies and uh, the rock of the eighties also, there was so fucking in seventies, the sixties. There are so many good bands. All of them, they are all fucking good, because at that time it cost a lot to go to record. So it was just only the cream of the cream that they can record an album nowadays. Every every child have a fucking studio at home, and they they can they can uh, re-edit their guitar for fucking fucking weeks and weeks, you know. So and re-edit fucking every notes. So ah, damn, uh, it's so that's why there's it's so, so many. So we need to dig in some all that crap to find the band that we liked. Like information nowadays. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we, we, we had so much information, so much fucking thing, and so what's the real thing? You don't fucking know. You need to fucking dig into it. You just gave me the image that's seen in Jurassic Park, fishing through the mound of Triceratops shit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, looking for the wedding ring or something. <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> Yeah, the playing field definitely watered down. There's no question about it. Like, there's, you know, there's, there's your great bands and there's still a ton of good shit out there, but you do have to sift. There's, there's no doubt about it. And I feel like a lot of it, like, it's pretty, given how, like, the technology, it's very easy to be pretty good. 
because everybody can clean everything up and make everything sound pretty good. So it's like most things I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But like it's very and it's almost like the kind of thing that's it's hard to verbalize why. But there are just some bands I'm like this. This has it. This has it. And this has something, but it's not it. I think for myself, like with all the old school guys that we are, even if it sounds good, it sounds like oh, the old Morbid Angel. It sounds like that. Oh. You can, you can, you can discern. You can feel if it does with heart or not. You can, you can, yeah. you can, you can hear if those guys are putting their guts on the table or or they're just like uh, put their hair like this. <laughs> <laughs> This is so not metal. <laughs> yeah, it's the very essence of not metal. <laughs> no, no, metal has changed. Metal, I, metal has evolved. <laughs> for, for me, uh, I, I always like that punk punk attitude. Kind of, you want to you want to break something, and then there's the rock thing. You, you know, you fucking. I uh, just want to drink beer and smoke joint and fuck that shit. And then those guys come in. <laughs> uh, you have a nine string guitar <laughs> yeah fuck off <laughs> <laughs> sorry for them but that's why we just download your uh, not not even download we just scroll into it we listen to 30 seconds and then i mean is there is, is there anything that's stuck out to you recently that you've heard that you've heard or are you still just mostly going back to the classics no, it's what I wanted to say. It's about you, we, we, all of us, we can hear when musicians put their guts on something, and it's it's done with heart, and with they have something to say, or there's an emergency, you know that that they, we fucking need to do an album right now because ah, it's too much, you know, instead of sitting on in front of your computer and you know it's not the same and but <laughs> I, I really like i really like that kind of new uh but it's not new but i mean uh, that kind of progressive black metal nowadays it, it um it, maybe if, uh, 15 years ago that that doesn't really exist that metal was just like yeah but nowadays we have that uh Oranzi Pazuzu, yes. um, um, other things like uh, I, I have a band for you guys. Uh, it's a good friend of mine from uh, Poland. Um, it's a band called Outre, O U T R E. Uh, okay. It's been a while. I didn't listen to it, but um, it's really like that kind of Polish uh, progressive black metal. But uh, yeah, I like it's, it's, they're going somewhere. They invent something. They, 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 there's a path, or and then you can dig into the music. You know, it's amazing. Black, black metal. That's worm. That's like your. That's what you're really into these like lately, right? Well, not just lately. For quite a while now, that's been your main. Your main. It almost has been. I never actually enjoyed death metal all that much. I much preferred black. Just because the atmosphere, or what you know, what, what I guess what draws you to it. The raw emotion of the real true black metal the, the originals and there's a there are some today that are actually you were mentioning a new aesthetic uh when i was with the uh, gang last week i was introduced to a band called dawn of ashes it's really quite interesting and then they treated me to something new from uh, dark funeral nailed them to the cross beautiful stuff true to style like a good pilsner. There we go. The Vox and Hops coming together. You know, beer and beer and metal. <laughs> stay tr- they can both, you can stay true in both in both of them. And I guess is is that so? I guess that's probably like your goal with uh, Raz Nuglia and whatever you may or may not do with them moving forward in a different name is you you, you really want to keep it true. You're not interested in experimenting. You kind of want to get that raw emotion. Well, as the vocalist, I get to display that emotion. Right. The musicians will write whatever they write and you know be as original as they like. But I'm the one who gets to spew emotions, and it's intensely satisfying. And I'm seeing where Matt is under the stairs. Uh, where we recorded the Hajri Kiasov was under some stairs. Not like that, though. It's like one of those 
little low staircases like Mike has over here. And yeah, I got to do my lyrics like under the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> one one takes, one takes, right, Wormy? I had to at this point. It, you know, try singing sideways. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking about position right now here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, story. When we were doing uh, the song uh, Goddess of Filth, uh, to get the breathing sounds, uh, I took a Michael Myers mask, because there was one in the basement, and Michael Myers doesn't have a mouth, right? It's just a slit. So I put the mic up to an eye hole and just breathed in the mask. So you <laughs> no way. <laughs> no way. Yeah. It's awesome. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome I, I love those like little studio this is how we made this sound my friend's band there's like some feedback on one of their albums and they uh they were making these noises they had rubber wrestling you know the old rubber wrestling figures that had like the wire in them so you could bend them they had those yeah. and they were rubbing them on the guitar to make kind of like weird feedbacky kind of noises I, lo I love that kind of stuff i think that that's awesome. so intriguing did you guys have you guys ever done anything like that in cryptopsy like an, a, any of you like was there ever any weird studio thing like breathing into a michael myers mask not that I remember. I don't mm. actually remember being in studio. I remember drinking in studio, but other than that, <laughs> it's like playing live. I never remember doing it. It just, the hour or half hour disappears. It's gone. It, it left no trace of itself behind. Fair enough. I'm sure that we've done some stuff, but it's not coming to mind. A weird, weird breathing stuff. You, you guys did some stuff, I think, Mike, no? Well, we, I mean, we, I know we, we, you know, we tried different instruments, you know, we added, added different instrumentation into, uh, into the songwriting. So, um, but nothing that was, not, nothing that I, I mean, I guess the closest, I mean, for, for myself, I know when I was in the studio, it was, it was lights out in the, um, uh, in the mic uh, booth and I had, um, incense going the entire time. Really? That's sort of my, my thing when, you know, when I go in, uh, in, into the studio, I like to have the atmosphere, you know, quite, uh, you know, just for my taste, you know, and part of that is being in the dark and just going at it, you know, and I don't, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I can say that's how I used to do it. It's been a while since I've done that. I, I haven't really been in, in a studio per se. A lot of times now it's been in like a fucking jam room or, you know, that's how we've been, how we, 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 we've been recording. The Curium was live in a, in a jam room, you know, that's how we recorded it. <clears throat> so yeah, so the lyrics are in front of me, but generally speaking, I, I don't have anything in front of me. It's just lights out and, and go yeah right on right on um so i guess you know we've talked about lyrics we've, we've spoken about vocal styles and, and it's hard to sum up all of that and it's i mean it's as hard to sum up the sound of cryptopsy because it's a very unique sound and it's you know had its its ebbs and its flows and it's changed i mean i guess to each of you what what kind of defines the sound of cryptopsy or the i guess maybe not the the sound because it's impossible to sum up the sound but like the attitude behind the sound like what does what is cryptopsy incarnate to each of you early on when steve tebow was in the band and we would drink so very copiously and it would help with the writing uh, you become brilliant when you're drunk we all know this it still does and uh, the idea was reaching the ultimate we were always in the penultimate moment but we were always striving for you know that final this is the fastest ugliest most heinous shit ever we have achieved this never it just never worked we got closer and closer and closer but no just we missed and would that come to to the point where you guys think that you've gotten there and then you'd hear someone else do something and it would be faster and more heinous at the time, uh, in the 90s, when I was in the band, um, we enjoyed what we were doing. You know, we liked the results. Uh, the first two albums, we were rather proud of at the time. But, you know, we were having a friendly competition with Cataclysm. You know, for Mike, like when you came in, like what did, what did you see as 
the, like I, I mean more my I appreciate that you think that you didn't reach the ultimate but for a lot of people cryptopsy is that band a lot of people think that cryptopsy is I literally was talking to my friend before this um because I posted on my Instagram story cool interview coming but I didn't you know and I put four microphones I got Matt's permission to post it because I didn't want to reveal what we were doing um and I was talking to my friend about um about it and he was like yeah it's like you know arguably like one of the the most you know intense uh extreme um literally right here let me read this that band fascinates me quite possibly the nastiest craziest band on the planet so for some people they think that you've achieved that which uh hell yeah so 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 mike did did you think that that, did you think that did you think was there something else that stuck out for you you know for a lot of people uh there's you know some of like the the jazzier influence and stuff that sticks out there's a lot of things that stick out so i'm curious like you as a fan originally at with necrosis and then you know sticking with them through cryptopsy as a fan and then joining what 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 defines cryptopsy for you uh you know that's a good question uh you know i the one thing that i can say is I, i i felt when when I had the opportunity to come in, I felt like I was stepping into pioneers of, of that style, you know, um, band that had, you know, uh, had already hit, like you said, like uh, to me, they are, they, they, they were already there, you know, they were at that level of, of, you know, that took them to that next level, you know? Uh, so for me, I felt like it was, you know, nobody was sounding like them. They were unique. It was extreme. Uh, in fact, we, we, we called it ourselves extreme music. You know, um, so it was extreme. It was experimental in a lot of ways, a lot of different techniques for guitars, those little, bling, you know, those little, all those little parts that were not, they were atypical for, uh, for, for metal bands at that time. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times it was pretty, you know, I love all that stuff, but it was all very straightforward, more straightforward, you know, but I think, I think it was, uh, for me, um, it symbolizes a band that took a lot of chances, uh, a band that wasn't afraid to, you know, change it up a bit and, and, you know, throw different nuances into a, uh, a scene that, or into a style that borrow from each other a lot. And we, I know that we, you know, we were not trying to, you know, at least, you know, for, you know, uh, when I, when I, you know, when I had come into the band, we, we would talk about like, we want to do something that's going to be different, you know, and, and not, something that people are going to look at or listen to and say, oh, fuck, yeah, that's like a Gorgats riff or that pot's a, this riff or Cannibal Corpse or what. So, you know, we, we did, I do remember saying that, like, you know, purposely not wanting to do a cookie cutter type of, type of uh, sound, you know, and those riffs and stuff. So I, I, you know, I do, honestly, I look at, look at the band as, as, as true pioneers in, uh, you know, in, in, in a, in a, uh, sit, you know, in a scene where there's a fucking wealth of bands and lots of bands that sound like, I don't think at the time anyone sounded like Cryptopsy at all. I mean, honestly, I'd argue to this day, you know, there might maybe a cheap imitation here and there, but yeah, it's, they're they're one one of it. Yeah, they're 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 something else. They're they're a mainstay, and and you know they've created they they've created that niche, and uh, that you know that's that's a that's a tough those are tough fucking shoes to fill as musicians to come in and try to copy that sound, you know? Hell yeah. And, and Martin, what's, what, what sticks out to you about the band? Like if you could sum up what Cryptopsy is, you know, especially considering we just came from that, that conversation of, you know, how, you know, phoned in a lot of stuff is, and Cryptopsy obviously is not, but what sums them up to you? Uh, I can say, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, I was 16 and Cryptopsy was kind of part of me because uh, it was the uh, it was the band that uh, I I could express my rage uh, the most, and even even if with uh, even when I'm, I was not in anger, it was just like uh, fulfill something inside me, you know? maybe with worms or something like that. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but the, but uh, of course, could see uh, with. Uh, with Lord Worm and Mike after, uh, it, it has always that that guts on the table, as I said before, and uh, always um, perform and um, really with that punk attitude. Not that, you know what I mean when I say punk attitude. You know, like to, to break rules, and that's what I mean about that. I'm not think I'm not talking about rancid fuck. 
so yeah, it's, it's, so that that's why I was always a fan of that, of, of Kryptovsky because of that, and, and that band means uh, a, a lot of, to me. And uh, yeah, that's a uh, kind of a story too. When um, when when I heard that uh, they, they, they were looking for a new singer, and then I, I remember that I wrote uh, actually. Actually, they said you, you, you can apply until that date, and then it was like three days later. It was oh, fuck. But I wrote my email to Maurice, and uh, fuck, I stayed like maybe 24 hours in front of my computer before press send, just like thinking about. <laughs> if I press send, Maybe I have the, the, the opportunity to have it, but can I handle all of this? You know, and I was I think a good 24 hours. Like I was like, fuck, man, should I do it or not? Or this, it? And, and, no. and then I press send twice. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you didn't get it the first time. I guess I'll have it. That man, you sent me two, twice. <laughs> I would just want to be sure, you know? <laughs> amazing. amazing that's amazing for for myself i, I see cryptopsy as a as a living organism that has evolved it's it's constantly changing it's it's it depends on the members that are in the band at that moment too it's a time lapse of where they are personally and musically it is intense it is fast it is aggressive it is a uh, musically very prolific and uh i think that they set the bar not only for, for with with non so vile for 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 a whole bunch of and influenced a whole bunch of bands but with the whisper supremacy era the whole artisan era wouldn't exist that whole record <laughs> labels roster wouldn't exist if it wasn't for whisper supremacy but uh, i just want to add something uh, for, uh, about what i just said before uh before i press send and in my thinking uh process i knew that i had two big pair of shoes to <laughs> feel and was, that was the most like man, uh, uh, man uh, that's gonna be hard work you know <laughs> to, to, to replace worm and replace my just <laughs> Okay, we'll do it. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard job. <laughs> I, I guess just, just going back a little bit earlier, you know, Worm, you were saying, you know, your goal was to reach the, the penultimate back then. But then when you joined again for, for Want Was Not, was your was your goal any different or what were you uh, trying to accomplish there? All right. Flo had called me up asking me to teach Martin to be comfortable within the English language. Mm -hmm. I was an English teacher. We, we, we had some good times. <laughs> yeah, you had a nice place. I, I, I had a little anecdote, but I will say later. So anyway, uh, I was giving him a, you know, a friendly price. Uh, I wasn't uh, charging full price, and I would see him, I think, uh, was it every Friday night or something for a couple hours? We would be going over grammar and uh, pronunciation. Yeah. I've heard you tonight. You actually pronounced the letter H. Good. Well done. Thanks. Because you must have noticed this when, you know, Quebecois try to speak English, they reverse the H and the not H. You must have noticed. So anyway, so well done, feller. Thank you, Shin. Right. So, uh, but Flo was impatient. So here I was teaching for a couple months and they wanted him to be able to uh, be comfortable at talking to the crowd, right? And he calls me back after a couple of months. He goes, so how's he doing? I said, well, we're progressing. It's, it's coming. He goes, oh, so it's hopeless, right? So you want to come back? Bang. He said, uh, you going to pay me? Yes. Okay, I'll do it. I did it for money. I, I didn't do it to reach any goal. I just, they offered me the, con, the thing. And I thought, all right, well, I'll balance that with the teaching. So I did. But it was, uh, they handed me a fait accompli. It was, you know, 10 instrumentals. I said, like, okay, just put your words now. Oh, and by the way, the title is Once Was Not. Like, the fuck am I going to do with that? <laughs> Anything. <is kept laughs> Everything was not at one point. All right, fine. So then I had to do them, you know, in order and the order of, you know, what they handed me. And uh, I thought, all right, well then if the concept is Once Was Not, let's at least do it, you know, not historically, but we'll start at the beginning for the Big Bang. 
and move all the way through to, you know, the end. I, I did it because I was hired. I would have been just as happy just teaching. Right on. Right on. Because uh, I, I was paying you like fucking, like fucking small money, man. <laughs> <laughs> 10 bucks a week or something. It was for a couple hours work. Yeah, 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 something like 30, something like that. And it, the, I remember one day when you told me, okay, this time you have to come to my place. And then I figured out, oh, like fucking Scheiser, this is fucking far away. It was in Notre Dame de Grasse, something like that. Yeah, no, Tonnerre des Ormeaux. The Tabarnak, yeah. From Prefontaine, Metro yeah. Station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, it took like fucking one hour 15, one hour 20, maybe one hour 30, man. To, was, oh, man, okay. Then I, I figured out, man, this guy is doing that for me. Like once in a week, in the winter, coming there, this fuck, and like just giving him like 30 bucks. Damn. <laughs> Lugging that heavy briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the little anecdote I want to say, the, the first time, the first time we met at the Metro Prefontaine, then uh, you were shaved and you were there just with a blue, a blue winter jacket. So uh, I was there and then waiting for you. And there was that guy there with the blue winter jacket. No beard, <laughs> oh, no fucking mustache, no fucking nothing. And then... We were just like looking at each other. Uh, <laughs> oh, you, uh, <laughs> you? Yeah, okay, okay, cool. <laughs> so then we were walking home in the snow, and you, then you asked me, uh, that's a joke that uh, I can only do in French. You said, hey, uh, that's the vibe chez vous. Well, so pas vivant. That's the vibe chez vous, it's long and warm. <laughs> because we were, we were talking about drinking beer as well. And we had, uh, every evening that we passed together, we were dis uh, discussing some uh, really, really nice beer. And uh, yeah, it was all uh, of our turn. Sometimes it was uh, Worm coming with some stout and something like that. And then the next time it was me like, oh, about this shit, about this thing. We had that... Uh, that little beer sharing thing. Yeah. I got. I, I got a quick question uh, for you. Uh, for um, are you, were you proud of once were not? Once was not. Lyrically, sure. Yeah, lyrically, it's amazing. Uh, vocally, at least they let me experiment with black metal a little bit there in the cemetery. Yeah. So, but. No, no more than that. I'm actually uh, prouder of Non So Violent. Not because everyone loves it. Uh, I like my lyrics. Mm. Sorry. Mm. I love, we were mentioning Phobophile earlier. Yeah. In the kitchen with the screaming triple amputee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, I'm moving on to, oh, yeah, what do you got there, Mike? Oh, hey, dude, we got one. We got those two. That's the porter? Is that the Baltic porter? Oh, yeah, I want to know how it is. We got one. I'm bringing this. I chose this one for you. Ah, awesome. Okay, then I have it maybe down here. What, what are you drinking there? What's that? This is Cherry. From who? It's a, I don't know, it says A Cherries from Multi Brass Tingwick. Uh, it's kind of like a like a creek, I guess. Uh, cool. It's actually quite good. Nice Very color. Cool. The color's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and it's five... 5% on the nose. Perfect. I'm going to the Baltic Porter Bourbon from Barasari. Uh, Boregal Barasari Distillery. Shout out to Cedric and PA Mayu for, for hooking me up with this brew. And it's definitely for you, Mike, because I know that you love dark beers. Uh, a question that I like to ask return guests when I have the pleasure of doing that, I don't do it very often, is how has your craft beer palette evolved since our previous chat on Vox and Hops? Martin, you were the first one I had on the podcast. Uh, has your experience or your relationship with craft beer evolved since the last time we were hanging out? Oh, man, uh, uh, I, I started drinking like um, quotidianly, I mean, yeah, maybe every day <laughs> uh, since the 98. And yeah, so uh, I can say that, uh, but I'm not a guy that uh, like to, to, to Oshiza. 
Okay, yeah. So 20 percent. I need. I uh, need to plug my phone soon. But anyway. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, so at that time, I was drinking blue, Labat blue, whatever. And then a friend of mine, hey man, try the Stella well. Oh, okay, cool. And then tu, 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 escalate. And then I don't remember that, but I, um, yeah, it, it's. I think the taste for beer is like cheese. You know, kind of. Uh, you rise up when you're a child to eat fucking a single craft, you know. <laughs> but then you taste something else, and then it's developed. Okay? And yeah. Um, but now uh but it's it's like everything uh i mean it's cool to have like a few craft beer like like that gorgots or something like more uh indian pale ale i really really like that indian pale ale uh or american pale ale as well but uh some, sometimes too <laughs> as well uh, just, just a corona a corona it's really good you know corona and clamato <laughs> I've never had that. I, in the morning, in the morning, <laughs> well, worm, worm, you walked away again with, with the IPA. Are, are you still, <laughs> are, are you still not into the IPA since the last time we had a chat? Do I look trendy to you? <laughs> Do I look like I want to put a trend in my mouth? <laughs> I hope I don't. You, you wouldn't want to have the the brew juice that I had before the 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 smoothie sour with pineapple, coconut, and um, marshmallow. How was that? How was that? Good? It was delicious. It was. <laughs> what, was it a beer? Is that is that huge beer geek question that's going on? It was delicious. There's a time and a place for every beer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about that worm? I'll let you know if I ever taste it. Uh, where does it come from again? Did you see? It's Pop Brewski. Yeah, Old Montreal. Yeah, they've got a great Baltic porter. Fuck, is it? Yes, they do. Yeah, I was there with uh, Steve Tebow last time he was in town. Yes. How about you, Mike? Has has your craft beer palate evolved since our chat last January? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, you know it, it's funny because you know I've been drinking craft beers for a long time, and then when you asked me that question, I kind of froze. And I was like, well, uh, uh, Guinness, <laughs> because but I, you know, I do love, I do love my Guinness, but obviously it's a, it's a macro brewery, you know? So, but when you had, when you had asked me and I was, I was trying to think, I was like, I'm never going to fucking remember any of these, but I will remember one right now. I, like, it's one of those things that I, I, I love craft brewery, but I don't always remember the names and um, that's just my fucking brain. <clears throat> but but um, the one that I've been really digging on is uh, Tuol Muscatel. The uh, Tuom Tuo Muscatel, yeah, those that that series, pretty much everything that I've had from these guys, their Baltic Port is amazing. The mm -hmm. uh, Imperial Stout is Imperial Coconut Stout. It's fucking, it's stupid. It's uh, delicious. We have today. We have uh, we uh, we got uh, Old Brun or something. Yes, I love that. It's like a I brown sour or something. Haven't had that one yet. Love and it. then we also got the tan. Uh, the tan was yeah, I think it was the tangerine one. Um, tangerine citrus, and that's one I haven't had from them either. But uh, I, honestly, I think they're pretty much one of the better ones on the market right now. The ones that I've been drinking, those are those are like up there for me. Very cool, very cool, Bradley. You turn on into craft beer, and that's a okay. <laughs> yeah, nothing, nothing's changed there. <laughs> that, that was funny about that your coconut thing. That's a, just ridiculous. Really yeah, it's like you, you drink you drink a pina colada or a beer. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, a chip with a pizza taste. Like, yeah. Yeah. Cocoa, cocoa, cocoa and loco and beers and shit. <laughs> in, uh, in Germany, uh, there was that uh, pizza place that they had, like uh, a cheeseburger pizza. Wow. Uh, yeah, give me a cheeseburger or a pizza. That's just <laughs> together. Fuck. Uh, yeah, man, but uh, I'm actually at the tattoo shop. Oh, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, because I'm uh, I'm living just upstairs. Very cool. The tattoo, the tattoo studio and uh, um, the decoration here. I need to give credit to Eric de l'Etoile because uh, I just start uh, working with him. Uh, I was working with him uh, like uh, six years ago. I worked with him for four or five years, and uh, we had a good um, a good symbiosis together and. Uh, since uh, last January, he was, man, what's happening with your life, man? You want to come back, work with me, man? That would be awesome, you know. De l'étoile, la croix, man. 
you know, it's our destiny. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell everyone, tell everyone where this, this shop is so they can come get some tattoos from you. Uh, it's uh, 137 Curie Label in St. Rose. Very cool. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just want to show you this. That's a that's a pretty cool. That's like that. That's actually a fucking grizzly, man. Really? That's a what? Yeah, a grizzly, a that bear. A wow. grizzly, man. That's badass. Yeah, but yeah, it's, but that's a re a re nice uh, studio and really classy. And now we were just both of us, me and him. That's it. That's all. Very cool. One client a day. That's it. Awesome. Congrats. We're nice to have you home. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, since we're talking, we're talking about your artwork. I mean, you're, you know, you did some, some work for, for once was, once was not, uh, album. You did some of the art, I guess. As far as was not, yeah, I worked a little bit on it and I was, uh, <laughs> I want, I was the figure. Oh, I want this story. Oh, that's you? Yeah, I, I'm the guy who's crucified on the pole. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I, 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 saw, I saw that, uh, that uh, album cover came uh, based on a uh, post on Facebook like maybe a few months ago. Was, oh, yeah, that's me in the back. <laughs> yeah. And that's me in the front as well with the armor and with the fucking flag going through myself. And uh, the infographics make my arm a little bit bigger, you know? <laughs> Was that uh, Pepe? I thought Pepe did the. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Philip, yeah, he, he did that. And I also uh, that I was really proud, really, really um, honored that uh, Mike chose one of my painting for Acurion. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Thanks. Fuck, love yeah. that. I love that fucking painting. Thanks. Love it. Thanks. Uh, that was that. That was really good for me that uh, it's a painting that's like, are already done. So I don't need to work on it, you know, it's already there. But uh, as uh, I think- it's fucking brilliant. One of my favorites of all time. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you, man. But uh, I think it's- uh, And it was instant, huh? My thing, it was instant. As soon as I saw that, I was like, fuck, that's the album cover right there. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh, Olivier told me. Uh, Olivier uh, he said, ah, let's have a look at uh, Martin's work. And when, uh, when, you, when you saw that one, that's it. That's the one. So cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's, have a, let's, have, let's have a cheers on that, man. My In case anyone hasn't seen it. Yeah. Incredible. The there we go. Right there. Ridiculous. Cool. Like, super good. Yeah. Also, did Gorgats Colored Sands? Yep. I've got, I've got his page open on miscellaneous staff on Metallum right now. So I, I, I have all of the things, but I knew, I knew the Gorgots and the Cryptopsy and the Acurion because that was what I was doing, the research in and around that, right? And then there's, you know, Beyond Creation, Ag Augury, and, you know, yeah, I, your own band. I did the logo for uh, Augury. Really? Uh, and, like, uh, I, I used to do a lot of uh, band banners, you know, stage banners as well. Uh, you, you, you know, Matt, about that. <laughs> There's a cryptopsy one, right? You, like, huge. Um, it's, um, it's enormous. It's, it's so heavy uh, and man, it's enormous. That, that's and it's fucking banner. It's fucking 40 feet by 30 feet. Holy shit. Wow. Dude, I passed three, three days before the, the live concert of the live album. Three days, three days before painting that fucking shit on my knees on the floor, man. Oh, yeah. Damn. <laughs> and even I did that for That's the medley. And then at the end, fuck, it's too big for the medley, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we were talking earlier about, you know, the sound of, of the band and, and, and we were kind of at the place where, you know, uh, Worm had done once was not. And then, you know, uh, Matt comes in and for the Unspoken King, which is probably the biggest sonic departure for the band. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people, Matt, you're probably a pretty easy scapegoat for them to pin that on. But I under like, you know, that it was already being written before. Like, I, I, I know Worm said that the, the opening riff for Contemplate Regicide, that he heard that riff and he really liked it. So, like, the, the music was, it was kind of already going in that direction. So it's like... I guess 
what, how do you guys feel about that album and like the uh, i personally think it's gotten an unfair rap amongst people i think people are like being more chill about it now and and you know you know even mike was was saying earlier um was was saying some really kind words about it and you know but it is still regardless like of if you like it or not it is the dark horse amongst the discography and that it definitely is the the furthest out there so i'm curious how you guys feel about that and how that fits into cryptopsy well that riff that i was uh, talking about that i like uh, alex auburn composed that uh in australia someplace i mean we were just doing sound check one night and he started noodling that and said keep it and that's uh it's 2007 isn't it that's exactly yeah but that's so yeah at least partly written by alex auburn but uh the, the record was you know the, the I, just as wormy got handed 10 songs to to write once was not i was handed the exact songs that were going on the unspoken king i was never there while they wrote I just, which is the complete opposite of anything that Mike has ever been a part of, because he was always there. Um, I just took the tracks and started writing because they they had already finished everything. Yeah. I was handed another fait accompli, the first I had as nuclei. I was just given a disc with a bunch of instrumentals on it, saying, "Okay, add, uh, add your vocals." But then the second album, I got to be there with them during composition. Hence the Michael Myers mask and the eye hole, and that was actually a lot of fun. It makes a makes a difference being uh, being being there for for the the you know the the, the creation of a record. <clears throat> you know, I mean, it is there's definitely. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say it's easier or it's not easier or whatever, but I think there's something to be said about being being there for it, as opposed to you know getting something handed to you and uh, good good luck with it. <laughs> Come it back to us in uh, three months and uh, whatever. It guarantees you know. satisfaction at least. Yeah, you know you were yeah. there for it. So yeah, I like this. Yeah, and you're hearing it all the time too. It's it's different than than having it on, you know, just listening to it on your headphones and like trying to piece it together versus actually being being there and feeling the riffs. You know, as they put together and feeling the band, you feel the, you know, you get that whole live aspect of it uh, and you start to build from there is a, is a different approach than the dynamic yeah. as well. Yeah. I remember when uh, Dave Gallia was in the band yeah. when he came in with uh, Gravage uh, Cryptopsy, yeah. was that, that opening riff. Oh, yeah. The only thing I could do was to shriek my lungs yeah, out. I loved right. it so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, awesome. Just bashing away. Yeah. <laughs> That's how that did it. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> and it's the uh, Abbey Gore. And we put that fucker down in less than 20 minutes. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. Flip through the book. There it is. It fits. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it helps, I think, too, because when you've got the whole band there and everyone's working, because, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, I, like, like you said, you, it, it, when, when the riffs are being put together and you're, you're, you're there for the, for the moment or the three week span of the songwriting or whatever the fuck it is, you, you're, you're adopting, you're, you know, or adapting to what's being written on the, on the, on the spot. So you've you've got some ideas to start throwing out immediately, as opposed to post uh, you know post uh, creation of the song, and then now you you're handed something. It's like you've got a full painting to to put your brush strokes in. But but when you're there, you're piecing it together as they're piecing it together, yeah. as the whole band's piecing it together. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a different feel. I think personally, I think. You know. Now you're 100 percent right because I've done both. Where for the new material that we are writing right now for the new record, I have been there for a lot of it. And it's it's you understand the song better because cryptopsy is very yeah. complex. The time signature switches, yeah. the traps, um, and in previous situations, I have to seriously sit there and yeah. count everything out on paper to understand what yeah. the hell they're doing, so that I know how many lines I can drop of lyrics. Versus if I'm with them, I it's already the the framework is in my mind because I'm watching them build it. It's like watching them build the Absolutely. house. So I know where all the rooms are. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There, I mean, I guess the one thing that I'm thinking of here is I know that all of you played with Flo Meunier, Jean Levasseur, and Eric Langlois. And those are the, the members that you all have in, in common. So I guess, you know, in, in terms of writing, in terms of touring, in terms, is there, because, you know, if I asked you about another member, maybe one or two of you could talk about it, but are there any things that, that stand out uh, about those those members? I mean, I've heard, you know, Flo is, you know, you know, he's been running the band for so long, you know, like, you know, I've heard some stuff like, you know, he's, he's, he's methodical. Um, in, in how he runs the band, I've heard. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious how 
how each of those like how it is being in a band with all those guys because they kind of formed the, the the core of the center of the band's uh career i guess Absolutely, I would throw Alex O'Byrne in there because we all played with him. Oh, did he? My bad. Uh, I'll I'll go first. Flo 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 is, has been leading the band for quite a while. When when I joined the band, I think that they were actually going through a, a leadership transition, and I think Flo sort of took over when the Unspoken King was being written. I feel like that's what was happening. I wasn't there before, so I don't know for sure. But that was the feeling that I got about the the future of Cryptopsy when I joined the band. But uh, he he does run a tight ship, and he he knows what he likes. He knows what Cryptopsy is, and he doesn't like to do from that fair enough i can say like uh what what i've noticed like in the first the first uh real show we had together even before i got hired um i can really uh, i really noticed that the complicity with uh, john and flo even maybe after the concert there were not that much complicity or whatever but uh during the jam and uh composing song or whatever they fucking understand each other like fucking really, really well. Instead of oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And they were just doing it like right away. It's how the fuck? <laughs> yeah, that, that was just amazing how they could like just just with words or or a glimpse of eye, like and they know like okay, you know. That was amazing. Mm. Yeah, I agree. They, uh, they, they, they had that, you know, I mean, as, as a lot of musicians do, we have that lingo that we can pull that stuff out. I mean, if you're in tune, you're in tune. So you know, those, little, those little time changes, you know, spoken out uh, are, um, you know, if, you, if you, you've been playing with somebody for long enough and there is that click that's, that's happened or is happening on that moment, like, yeah, and those guys always, always had it. Those two in particular. Yeah. You know, the two of them just, it just, I, they get in a room and, you know, I, I said this the last time, uh, Matt, you and I were talking about it. It's, it, it's, it's magical. Like it's, you know, it, th those, those are like proud moments to be a part of, to see that action in place, you know, that happening. Uh, fuck man. Like, uh, you know, I know what happens with other bands and shit, but it's not, you know, th those other bands aren't our experience. That's our experience, you know, and, and those guys just, you know, together. I mean, you, aside from the brilliant musicianship of, you know, of really everybody in the band, everyone that's come through that in and out of that band is knows their instruments. They're, you know, they're, they're well adept at, at, at playing. They're well adept at working with others. You know, it just, it's just one of those bands that no matter where you are in the, in the discography or where you are in the catalog, you know, you, you've got top notch people performing, you know, and, and when that click is there, it's, it's something to be, you know, be held, you know, it really is. And I, I would say that's the thing that, that, you know, most I'd walk in and that was always something that I would uh, always feel was quite remarkable was, was that camaraderie of writing music. Yeah. Another reason for singers to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, Martin, you were saying when they were like composing stuff. So how much would that have been stuff that, went on the once was not album that you were around when they were composing then uh yes um uh, yeah I, I was there um i was there at the beginning and then i don't know uh how can i say um maybe maybe there's a little distance appeared between us uh and maybe maybe something in my head i don't know because i i used to be with my first band that i had before spas we were like uh, five really good friends that we were, uh, even in IBCB before, we were living in the same building. We, we were um, uh, four friends living on the second floor. There were five in the first floor and we had the rehearsal room in the basement. And then we moved to Montreal and uh, somebody took a flat in uh in that building and then another flat get empty and then the guitarists get there and then, uh, the, then another flat and so the drummer went there so we were all together again in the fucking same building uh with, there was a, a a really really close friendship we were all fucking always together and um even some uh, fuck one night we just arrived from doing a fucking bad concert by bad because there were two <laughs> two person there that 
that page. That happens. Oh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Action bail. Action bail. <laughs> <laughs> so so then we we came back and uh, we bring all the fucking uh, all the things uh, of, of the real showroom that at that, uh, that time we were uh, um, uh, we rent uh, something at the Cité uh, 2000 Cité 2000 Classic. so we bring everything at our place and then the next day we were drunk something like hey uh, do we jam we got we have stuff everything here we got the drum we got the, the fucking the PA everything so, Oh yeah! So let's do it until the police arrive. So we <laughs> set up the drum and everything, and uh, we had the time to uh, play four songs before the car. That's uh, I'm impressed. And, and when <laughs> I saw that because we had a fucking big uh, patio door in just in front of the Sherbrooke Main Street, <laughs> so everybody everybody on the street could see us like. <sighs> <laughs> and, then, and then I saw the cops arrive. I said, oh, "Okay, man, that this dude, that's the time we need to shoot." And then I just opened the door, and the police they were, mm-hmm. and then, uh, "Yeah, we were waiting for you." <laughs> so, so we already we already closed everything. We already closed everything. That's fine. We, we just want to play a few songs, and that's it. And they said, yeah, it's because your neighbor beside the old woman, all the fucking biblo, all the fucking <laughs> friends get out of the wall. Uh... Stuff that she'll never forget. <laughs> you know, she probably still talks about it. Like, to make a comeback to your question before, it's, uh, you know, uh, then when, when I read Top Seat, it was way more professional, way more like a job to do and something like that. And... Um, then I, I was maybe missing that kind of friendship, like, you know, something like that. And that maybe, maybe it's in my head that that little distance coming. And then that's why I, uh, there's sometimes they were just like uh, working in one for one riff for one hour. So it's man, uh, what the fuck, you know what? And yeah, I was trying to write a little bit. With it. And then, then it came out like that you know yeah i don't have anything to add on that it's happened like that right on right on yeah i was just i was just curious like because uh you know you never you didn't appear on the album but you were you were around for some of it getting writ- written so oh, that's, that's, that's yeah, interesting of course, of course. I, I was there when Flo came out i have the title of the next album and he just printed on the paper and he just opened it but, Okay. Really? <laughs> Very cool. The unveiling. Maybe you, you watch a few uh, a few uh, Clint Eastwood movies before, and then oh, once was not. <laughs> <laughs> I can say some words about Alex O'Byrne and uh, Eric Lagua. Eric Lagua was one of the funnest people to party with. He had the loudest laugh. <laughs> He was he was he was really lots of fun to to party with on tour. Uh, Alex was one of the first people on tour to to take me on walks and to go check out cities, and I love that the relationship that I had with him on tour. Yeah, uh, man, me, me too. Uh, like maybe, maybe um, uh, Flo and John and Eric, they already went to Prague a few times, so they don't give a shit. They was just staying in the the tour bus, you know. So, and me and Alex, we were man, we had two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a beer somewhere, you know. Fuck. All right. We are in Budapest. We are just have a walk somewhere, man. Yeah, that's true. He and I did the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. We were the ones that, uh, if, if we were going anywhere, it was it was with him, uh, or uh, or I did a lot of traveling, uh, like through cities with uh, Carl from uh, Nile. He was he was yeah, cool. he was the other guy that like okay we got time let's get the fuck out of here let's go yeah. let's go see this. City. Yeah. I still do that. I, I love to to take advantage. Absolutely. Hey, to drink some beer. <laughs> be, be, to simply not be in the tour bus or backstage, especially nowadays, because everyone's just looking at their phone the whole time. There's, nobody's talking anymore. <laughs> 
Do you have anything else there, Bradley? If not, I'll, I'll do a wrap up question. Uh, I mean, I guess the last kind of things, I mean, I was just going to ask what you guys have got going on, but I guess we've all, we've kind of danced around all that. I mean, um, Worm is potentially doing more music with uh, Raj Nuclear uh, people under a different name. Uh, Mike's got a Curion. Um, Cluster, Cluster Void. Void. Cluster Void. And, uh, and I have another project right now that we're we're working on six songs. I don't know if it's going to be more than that, but the project is Uncle Stalin and the Communist Joy. Uh, and uh, yeah, this this is this has got to be something else. Patrick Hamlin and uh, uh, Matthew Barabin. Oh yeah, and, that's we got man. Cool. Yeah, He's yeah. Fuck it. It's just drummer, be, man. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fuck it. Alex, do like I mean, it's just got to be. It, the songs are already put together. We went to, we did the drums at uh, Wild Studio, and um, fuck, it's just I, I, I don't know. I, it's gonna be something else. It's very different and very, very fucking heavy and groovy, and it's just mean. It's a mean fucking song. I mean, mean. So far, the six songs they're just mean and tough. And, <laughs> it's yeah. just mean. It's just mean. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what else to say. It's fucking mean, man. Awesome. I've heard some of it when I interviewed uh, Mathieu, and it's it's down tuned guitars. Oh yeah, it's 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 fucking brutal. He's recording guitars right now, and it's just pulverizing. It's ridiculous. How was it for you going back to Wild Studio? For me, that was the first time I was at Wild Studio. Oh, okay. I felt like that's when when where you did Whisper and everything. No, no, we did that at uh, Victor Studios in uh, in Mark. Really? Yeah, okay. at the RCA uh, studio. Yes, of yeah. course. Yes. Um, so we did both those albums uh, there. Um, but going back to Wild, you know, because uh, unfortunately I didn't get to see Pierre. I was very excited to see Pierre, uh, but uh, but we 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 didn't connect. Unfortunately, I came a, I came a day uh, after. But he's he is so well set up over there. The place is just absolutely gorgeous, stunning. Yeah. If if you know any any bands that are looking to get the fuck out of the city and do something that's yeah, you know, awesome. you're away from away from the bullshit and it's just focus on music. That place is the place to go. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe I get I'm getting drunk or whatever, but a little, another little anecdote from that wild studio. Uh, we went there to uh, mix that uh, live album, and um, it was what was that fucking band? Metal, metal. Anvil. Huh? Anvil. Yes. Yes. Anvil. Yeah. It was Anvil just before us, and uh, for the album uh, Thirteen. And uh, fucking Pierre told us that those guys just arrived there and it's, it's so fucking cozy in the basement eh, with the living room and all that. You know, it's really the PlayStation, the big fucking 60 inch TV. Big kitchen. Yeah so, yeah, so those guys, they were just like chilling out for two weeks there, just playing state PlayStation. And then, uh, yeah, maybe we can start uh, taping the drum. Slowly, you know, after two weeks, <laughs> and they're paying fucking four hundred bucks a night. They're That's every uh, day. <laughs> Ouch, dude! Holy shit! What's that? <laughs> well, I can say that when we were there, it was really it was about getting down to business. I mean, sure, we fucking partied like big time. We had we had a we had a great time, and we went to enjoy you know the scenery, we went to enjoy the you know the space and stuff. But we we took the time to record. I mean, we recorded fucking water. We went out at twelve uh, one in the morning and recorded, set up two microphones and just got the sound of the water hitting the rocks ever so gracefully. Like yeah. and it sounds like a national geographic. Like we were like, yep, we got it. You know, just like shit like this. We were just like, fuck we're here. Let's you know we pulled out the old Mellotron and uh oh, sorry the old uh not the Mellotron but the, uh, the old mini mook. And just started fucking around. We, we, you know, record an hour and a half, two hours worth of shit that I don't know we're going to use. You know, if we don't use it for this, we'll use it for something else. But a ton of stuff. Like, you're there. What the fuck are you doing playing PlayStation? <laughs> like, <fine. laughs> you know, fine. You want to, you know, you don't get fucked up over there. Yeah, that's a place to get fucked up for sure. Yeah, you need to, like, come on, man. You're, every room in that place you can record. You can set up a mic. In, you can set up a mic. He's got a, he's got like a, and I'm sure you guys have all seen it. That ba- when you go through the bathroom in the back and you go in, there's this like little spare room that's over there, and it's actually on a rock. There's a, like a, an incline of this rock that's in the basement, and he's got these two little rooms that you literally have to be crouched down like you and, and when you're recording, but probably even more. And you can record in all these rooms, man. It's like if you're not, if you, can, you can be taking a shit and fucking record. You know? Wow. So, you know, like if you're not recording, you're playing PlayStation. Fuck you, missing the boat. Hey, Worm, have you ever recorded in a coffin? 
No. Uh, when I had uh, my coffin made uh, back in the 90s, uh, it was Steve Tebow's idea, and the uh, band paid for it, paid a coffin maker in Sherbrooke 300 bucks for this thing. And went and picked it up, and I brought it home, and I slept in it that first night. Not thinking, that, you know, chemically, the stain on the wood was going to really give me a bitch of a headache the next morning. Oh. Oh. <laughs> bad enough I got a bad back, but man, my headache the next morning just from the fumes of the stain. Oh. Uh, I just didn't know if, you know, you, you, you did that under the stairs, if you'd ever kind of brought a mic into the coffin and seen how that was. What I would have liked to have done and never, it just didn't happen. I would like to uh, really build up my leg muscles and I would have put a couple of straps uh, where my feet would be. And what I wanted to do was to pull, you know, a Nosferatu and like rise out of the coffin like that picking, you know, awesome. picking myself up with my feet. Never got the chance. Oh, damn, that's what that <laughs> so sick, funny. yeah. With, with, with your oh, Jesus. <laughs> with your <laughs> <and> <laughs> just, oh, 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 <laughs> and that shit's copyrighted. Nobody fucking steals that. Hell yeah! <laughs> it, it'll happen. It'll happen when Worm moves into his retirement community uh, this year, and then uh, he'll be able to practice that. Um, or he rises to dinner. I mean, honestly, like <laughs> at four p.m. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I have two questions left that kind of wrap it up and, and that kind of ties into it. It says, you know, any any like things you do differently or, or regrets or whatever that you have in the cryptopsy thing. And I guess I guess for Worm, he wishes he 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 built up those leg muscles and done, had done that. But is there anything else for any of you guys where, you know, you, you wish things had gone differently? I'll start. I, I wish that the unspoken king <laughs> what, what was was was, uh, you know, put together more cohesively. I wish that the band had a more clear vision of what they wanted it to be, and I wish that we could take another stab at it. Could be for the future. Who knows? I doubt there'll be clean vocals ever again, though. <laughs> bury them, bury them like in those the mix. Ones, at least. You just put them down there. <laughs> it is a modern era where we're cattle decapitation and... Uh, Shadow of Intent are, are reigning with clean vocals in extreme metal. Yeah. So, Cryptopsy was yet again avant-garde. Too ahead of the time. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, I think I think you nailed it. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Martin? If you could you could redo something, what would you would you like to redo? Uh, I would like to redo that live album with a with the, in a better shape. <laughs> That's what I would like to. Uh, because that's the only thing I've done. <laughs> when you listen to it, do you hear that you're not at your full potential? Uh, mm, yes, because I I know that I could, like, especially about the, you know, the uh, especially about that, and uh, even uh, it's a uh, fucking defenestration with the long uh, the long scream at the end, man. Usually, I could do it until the end of the song and even continue a little bit more, even when they shut down. And that night, and, and I had so many critics about that. Oh, you cannot do it. I can, but, but anyway, it, I know I can do it. I've done it. And it's cool. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I just wish that I could have uh, a bit better, uh, better uh, throat shape. Uh, that night and that's it uh, but um, uh, yes that, but besides that besides performance uh, maybe with uh, attitude I could do a lot more that's my I'm ashamed about that that uh, I don't know with, with uh, an objective view over it uh, f many years later uh yeah, maybe uh, maybe I could I could be more into it because to to be a part of, that, of a band uh, and you Worm and uh, Mike you know as well and you Matt as well uh, you sh you know it, you need to always be there one hundred uh, one hundred twenty percent not uh, one hundred percent is not enough you need to be one hundred twenty percent always always there. And uh, maybe that's somehow it went down to 110, 
100, and then 90. And then maybe when I reach the 80%, the guys will, hey, dude, do something, you know? And uh, yeah, that's, um, that's my luck. I can, uh, I, I'm honest, I can, I can say it. <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, if, even if, even if, maybe if I was, uh, I'd done my 120% out of the way, maybe it will end up anyway, you know? It's, but it's a part of my life that I will really, really adore. And it's, uh, it's a part of me. And I really, really fucking proud about it to be a part of Crutopsy and singing, s singing like uh, worms, uh, warm songs that I was listening when I was 16, singing that live on stage and giving my guts to, to, to the crowd um, because it was, it was really that uh, live. I wasn't there. 80%. I was there fucking 150% <laughs> uh, all the time. And uh, it, it, even, even you, even you, Mike, uh, too, as well, when uh, fucking singing a machine, man, you need to be fucking there. And uh, all that. So, but uh, yeah, that it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's brought me a lot, a lot, a lot into into what what I am now. Yeah, yeah. Living in a poor bus for fucking thirty days in a fucking bunker and ah, man, the, the the worst a little souvenir like that. My first tour, you choose your bed, and then I took the on the third the third level bed. We were in front. top bunk, and the bus is always going like this. When when he's taking a curve, he's going like, and every night I was, okay, that's it. We are falling. We're we're falling, <laughs> and that, that's it, man. It, this is, it's right now. And oh no, don't you just the other side? Oh man, we're falling. We're falling, man. That's it, man. Every fucking night for thirty days, man. The next door, I took the bed on the first floor just to have less. <laughs> I miss I miss lying in a bunk and being driven that that driving feeling man it just puts me to sleep I love it. Uh, Worm had a question for you as you were saying something. What were you asking, Worm? What percentage was Martini running at the night that uh, back in I guess two thousand five? Martini, Mike, and I shared the stage. Really? See, I didn't know that. Which one? We did. Yeah. No. No. For the, uh, I, for the I shared the not tour. Not me. No, I definitely didn't. I hadn't seen the band live. I never, I never, I never shared share a stage with you, Mike. No, we never did. It, no, 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 we did. Yeah, Matt, Matt and I, Matt and I, and, and, and you, we did. Two thousand eleven, Montreal. Yeah, two thousand eleven, heavy MTL. I mean, that we did. No, I wasn't. I wasn't there. No, you weren't. No, no, but the three of us did. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say that I always appreciate having you come out and do songs with us whenever we come through when we were, were coming through germany now you're back home so we will have that privilege more often it was always amazing you were so intense and i love it so are you saying i'm guilty of a fake memory yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean worm to be fair for the, most of the interview you said you forgot a lot of this stuff no you're you're incriminating yourself here my man <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> How about you, Mike? What would be something you'd like to redo? Uh, I would. It would be uh, parts. I wouldn't say the whole album, but parts of uh, "And Then You'll Beg" uh, that I had some difficulty with. Uh, you know, it's, it's no mystery. I, I, I had a, a raging cold, and it, it was it was tough. Uh, that was my toughest experience uh, in, in the studio. So there was definitely some stuff that I hear, and I'm just like, nah, man, it's not what what it was supposed to be. And, Stuff like this, and I had to cut a few few parts out that I just it wasn't in. I wasn't in it. So um, you know, uh, I, I, there is you know, I would maybe go as far as to say maybe half the records, redo half half the half the vocals, or you know, somewhere in that range, forty to fifty percent. I, I would probably like another. Track. That's something that we should do. <sighs> Seriously, <laughs> yeah. yeah, retake of it. Why not? No, seriously, but. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, and it's not to say that I'm not, I'm, like, I'm ashamed of it or I'm not proud of it or anything like that. Like, I'm, I'm proud of 
you know, all, pretty much everything I put out, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of for whatever period of time it was and things like that. So, you know, I'm proud of the ideas for that record. Uh, I, you know, the lyrics, um, you know, I was really happy with, I was really happy with the arrangements and, and, you know, all the vocal parts. I really felt that that, that album was, was a strong record, but I just, I had a hard time with it. So I would, I would, I would change it, change at least a few, at least a few of those parts. Every song's got something that I'm like, eh. Which is hard. It's, it's hard to, to re-listen to moments like that. Yeah, I don't listen to that record, honestly. And it's it really shit like that. I don't, I, you know, if I'm going to listen to a Cryptopsy record, it's, you know, uh, it's going to be, yeah, for sure. It's going to be. Wow. No, we're going to do that. It can be like a birthday present to you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to the, we'll go to the grid and you just bang it out. Yeah, my fiftieth uh, birthday. There you go. We'll, we'll organize it. Yeah. Like it's like suffocation redoing uh, breeding. Yeah. Maybe like one track, one track uh, at a time. Yeah. Over their whole career. Um, and worm, are there any other you know regrets other than not learning how to uh, do the Nosferatu? No. No. Uh, the uh, the nineties were fun because it was, uh, we weren't big yet, we weren't known yet, we were a garage band, but we had a bit of a reputation, so that was fun, and we were drinking ourselves stupid regularly, which is <laughs> fine. It gives you a body like this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, once was not, I was a hired gun. So I, I like being in Europe, I like being in Australia and Japan, got to see, you know, a bit more of the world, which is fine. But yeah, that was getting paid. That, that I really enjoyed the money. Hell yeah. It's important. It's necessary in this life. Well, buzz the booze. <laughs> Touche. Touche. Because yeah, the, fucking people, cause, cause the uh, promoters aren't giving the top quality beer. That's for sure. You're not getting any top shelf shit. I'm working on it. I'm working on good, it. Good. Good man. Please do. Change that. <laughs> you change your rider to, I got to pick my beer. Period. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, some places, uh, you, you got away with it, but most places, no. Hell yeah. And I guess the last question here is more of like, I'm just curious, you know, because, you know, obviously like Quebec has such like lore in, in terms of, uh, you know, metal and especially extreme metal. I mean, like being a, a part of the scene, is there any inkling that you guys have? Like what what's up with Quebec? Like how has it made such an impact on on extreme metal? Yeah, you're right. We have to. We have That's an answer. Question. <laughs> we have an answer. <laughs> no, no, you have the answer. Cannibal Cam asked you this question, right? Yes, yeah, but but you know what? But we nailed the fucking well, we him he nailed the fucking nailed it. So nail it now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, prog rock, progressive rock from the sixties and seventies was coming to Montreal. Like Genesis played at the University of Montreal, and here in Montreal is a college town like Boston. So you got you know all these students listening to music enjoying this really progressive stuff and it stayed with them and then these students wound up being parents who had kids hearing this music and so it stuck with quebec and especially montreal this progressive musicianship and songwriting and it just throw on 17 distortion pedals and you know like that you i think that's right yeah, I, I, I didn't thought about that but it's true uh and it meant really, yeah, I, 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 you went to follower in that. It's because of Genesis and all that. That's yeah, that's great. I think you're right. true. Yeah, I mean Quebec, Quebec is lovers of fucking prog, prog. I mean that it, prog into uh, in Crotopsy, but even into Gorgos, Oblivion, absolutely all that, all those bands. Voivod. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, I'm such a fan of boy bands, but uh, you, you can feel that it's not only like three, four riffs. Blah, 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 blah. It's it's like always like going somewhere, and it's it's true, man. Yeah, and it's often instead of uh, the uh, blues or rock structure, you know, the four or four or whatever, it's almost symphonic. Mm -hmm. Really, you're going from part A to part B to part C, and you're just moving forward with mm -hmm. no repetition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that, that, that's awesome that you mentioned that, uh, Dan, that, uh, that because of Genesis hit Montreal, it spread as some seeds or some roots. Sure. Mm -hmm. But even like yeah. the Quebec bands, like Beau Dommage and all those, I mean, there's, there's, just, there's a ton of like 
70s, late 60s, 70s yeah, fucking right. prog, uh, prog bands from yeah. Canada. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Or Quebec. Like, uh, it's always been instilled here. You know, it's it's just, you know, that's the answer of all answers. <laughs> there's, there's a, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Harmonium. Uh, I was going to say them. Oh, yeah, them too, yeah. But Harmonium, and sometimes I'm listening to Opeth, and man, man, uh, does does Michael Ackerfeld listen to to Armonia? I'm sure those albums are awesome, man. I've been listening to a lot of those <laughs> lately too. They're great records. There's some parts that it's so fucking similar, man. It's like, man. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely gonna quote you, Warm, because I get that question no matter what interview I do. So, so I'm gonna be quoting you for that answer for for the rest of my career. <laughs> yeah. So, do I get royalties on that? <laughs> I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Not an IPA. I will buy you a nice, 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 <laughs> nice pina colada, pina, pina colada mushroom mesh. I'm sure you would have liked it because because it would have made your semen taste great. <laughs> 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 I'm going to wrap this up with a, a classic wrap up question, which I don't believe I asked you guys. Um, what is your hangover cure? Mm-hmm. No, you didn't ask. No, I don't. I, I think I started it after you, Mike. What is your hangover cure? It doesn't happen very often because you guys are very methodical, thought out humans. But every once in a while, we get hangovers. And what would be your hangover cure? Bradley, you never have a hangover, so you live the perfect life. <laughs> <But> it happens <laughs> every once in a while that we get a hangover. So, Martin, when you do have a hangover, what is your cure? Time. Time. Good answer. <laughs> it's the only right answer. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes when it's been like a few days, then then you're just your body's telling you you need fruits, like pineapple. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but no. But usually, as I said before, I, I used I used to drink uh, every day since a long while. And uh, but I'm not a guy that likes to 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 be drunk. Uh, I already know when um, when's my last beer. I know when it, that's that's the shot I shouldn't take. This is the beer I shouldn't take because I'm I'm totally okay right now. So uh, I I still have my head because as my brother told me once to know your limits. You need, you need to pass through your limits to know where's your limits. So I passed all of them. So now I know where's my limits. Uh, how about you, uh, Wormy? What is your hangover cure? Or do you still get hangovers? I haven't had a hangover in years and years and years. But the thing is, and this is true, I probably mentioned this last year. I started drinking when I was four. <laughs> and I just turned 55. I've been drinking for over 50 years. I've been drinking longer than most people have been alive. Eventually, you get good at something. So I'm so good at drinking now, I don't get hangovers. <laughs> and you, Mike? Uh, for me, it's a sleep, a lot of sleep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly, it's, yeah, I'm letting you know from the start of this conversation. I knew you were going to ask no, um, uh, it's sleep and then followed up with some greasy ass food. <laughs> you guys are amazing. This is a perfect way to celebrate the two year anniversary of my podcast, Vox and Hops. I want to thank you all individually. Uh, Lord Worm, Mike DeSalvo, Martin Lacroix, Bradley Zordrager, all Vox and Hops alumni coming together to celebrate the two-year anniversary for the podcast. I can't thank you enough. This was epic and amazing, something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Shout out to Thomas from Redefining Darkness, who has already had Lord Worm and Mike together, and I was jealous as fuck because he did it before I wanted to do it, and I told him when I interviewed him, but I did it, and I included Martin, which was my original plan. So cheers to you. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, two years has been great. Can't wait to see what's coming up in the third year of Vox and Hops. But uh, thanks to people like you and everybody that listens at home. The sky's the limit. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Fucking right. Cheers. Cryptopsy. Vox and Hops. Uh, such an amazing evening. Like, really, I'm honored. 
Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. I loved this. This was so much fun. What a great night. We kept hanging out after this. It was it was such a blast. The four vocalists had never been in the same room before, so so I was excited to do this, and it was, it was uh, not disappointing in the least. We had a great, great time. A huge shout-out to Lord Worm, Mike DeSalvo, and Martin Lacroix for being so open, so honest, and being a part of this with me. I greatly, greatly appreciated that very much. Also, huge, massive thanks to Bradley Zorgdrager for being the guest moderator for this roundtable, which allowed me to participate much more and just enjoy the experience as opposed to having to guide the conversation. It was, it was actually a very refreshing experience, and I really enjoyed it. And I couldn't have thought of anyone better to ask to do this than Bradley, because he is really, in my opinion, one of the best metal media people out there. So massive thanks to Bradley. If you did enjoy this Vox and Hops episode, you should most definitely go and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. Vox and Hops is brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I hope you guys have a great weekend. I hope you guys get to relax. Tomorrow night, actually, I'm going to celebrate at the Vox and Hops Thirsty Thursday virtual Halloween party featuring a live interview with Nikki Kalan of Necrogoblicon. That is happening at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Send me a message if you would like to join. Come dressed up. Drink some pumpkin beers. It's a virtual Halloween party, people. And this is the first time that I've ever, ever moved a Thirsty Thursday to a Saturday. But Halloween during a pandemic, it seemed fitting. I will be back next week with two episodes. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hopsets. Oh,